Madiba, Tujhe Salam. Salutations to Madiba. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, and viewers in India and Africa and other parts of the world. This is Suhas Borkar, convener of the Working Group on Alternative Strategies, welcoming you to the fifth Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture 2022. On behalf of India International Center, South African High Commission, and the Working Group on Alternative Strategies. Chair of the fifth Nelson Mandela Lecture, President of India International Center, Sri Sham Saran, our today's speaker, Shri Gurjeet Singh, His Excellency, the High Commissioner of South Africa, Jeol Sibusiso Ndebele, fellow members of the IIC and the Working Group on Alternative Strategies, comrades from the South African High Commission, and viewers who are watching this program live on YouTube in India, Africa, and other parts of the world. Today, normally, we would have been addressing a public meeting of an audience from New Delhi only. But after we did the third and fourth Mandela lectures via special webinars due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we thought we will use the webcast technology to reach beyond this auditorium. And here we are. Today, thanks to the webinar technology, we are reaching out to Johannesburg and Pretoria Abuja, Addis Ababa, Khartoum, Nairobi, and Dakar, London, Washington, D.C., Dhaka, and across India. Every year today, on July 18th, in the morning, more than 300 school children drawn from 30 schools from National Capital Region of Delhi gather at IIC to celebrate the birthday of Madiba, like they have done for many years now. Setting the mood is the procession from the Gandhi King Memorial Plaza to this Deshmukh Auditorium with Indian and South African colors and joyous hails of Madiba Sujay Salam. We salute you, Madiba. But this year again, like the past two years, due to the pandemic, and we could not hold this event. High Commissioner Endebele, you would recall three years ago in, 2000, in 2019, you addressed the students in this very hall in the morning and it was overflowing, and there were so many questions for you about Madiba. Hopefully, we will renew the Mandela Katha Mala next year in 2023. We started preparing for this lecture some months ago, and when I emailed our invitation to Ambassador Gurjeet Singh to give the fifth Mandela lecture, he promptly replied, I am honored to accept your invitation to deliver the Mandela annual lecture. Gurjeet, in the opening line to the preface to his recent book, The Harambi Factor, India, Africa, Economic and Development Partnership Rights, Africa has fascinated me from my childhood. When Gurjeet speaks or writes about Africa, he does so with knowledge and passion. A few weeks back, we were together on an IIC webinar discussion on Gurjeet's book, and I can vouch for both his knowledge and passion for Africa, which I am sure you shall all witness today. We are grateful to IIC President Sham Saran to kindly agreeing to chair the fifth Mandela lecture and keeping the tradition of the President IIC chairing this very important annual event in our calendar. This is for the first time that IIC has for a President an outstanding diplomat from the Indian Foreign Service, a former Foreign Secretary. We look, look forward to your address, sir. We are grateful to His Excellency High Commissioner Endebele to join us today as he did for the past lectures in 2019, 2020, and 2021, and to kindly agree to give the closing remarks. High Commissioner Endebele has been a comrade in arms with Madiba and spent 10 years in that brutal prison in Robin Island, and that gives a very special meaning to what he says and we look forward to his remarks today. I also want to stress on one critical lesson from Madiba's political life. Nelson Mandela's leadership was not divisive. He did not sow hatred among his people against others, but his leadership bound people together. This lesson 
is very relevant to the world today, and especially to India. Mandela put it quite clearly, I quote, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his background or his religion. People must learn to hate. And if they can learn to hate, they can be taught to love. For love comes more naturally to the human heart than its opposite, unquote. I have touched upon this in earlier lectures, but I want to very briefly talk about it today. On 10th April 1993, the ANC leader, Chris Hani, was assassinated while stepping out of his car at his home by a radical right-wing white immigrant, virtually plunging South Africa into civil war, as Jeremy Cronin said, with riots breaking out in Cape Town, Durban, and Port Elizabeth. In response to the assassination, Mandela, though yet not the president, addressed the nation on 14th April 1993 in an attempt to cool tempers, calling for a nation for a national mourning, a national day of mourning, I quote, tonight I am reaching out to every single South African, black and white, from the very depths of my being. A white man full of prejudice and hate came to our country and committed a deed so foul that our whole nation now teeters on the brink of disaster. A white woman, an Africaner origin, risked her life so that we may know and bring to justice this assassin. The cold-blooded murder of Chris Hani has shocked, has sent shockwaves throughout the country and the world. Now is the time for all of South Africans to stand together against those who, from any quarter, wish to destroy what Chris Hani gave his life for, the freedom of all of us, unquote. Later, as president of South Africa, by constituting the Truth and Reconciliation Commission under the chairmanship of Disman Tutu, Archbishop, he brought restorative justice through a national catharsis as the proceedings of the TRC were beamed to the drawing rooms and sitting rooms of millions across South Africa. Mandela truly founded a rainbow nation. So the lesson is do not be divisive, be inclusive, do not propagate hate, but bind people together. I thank you. Madiba Tujay Salam, I salute you Madiba. Now I call upon IIC President Isham Saran to chair the meeting and take over the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Suhaj Borkar, for your opening remarks. Um, let me greet uh, the Distinguished High Commissioner of South Africa uh, to India. We thank him for uh, his presence here today on this occasion. And of course, I would like to also warmly welcome my very dear colleague, uh, Gurjeet, um, with whom I have had a long association. And um, I don't think, uh, as, as Suhas said, we can find a better person to deliver the fifth uh, Nelson Mandela lecture than uh, Gurjeet, because uh, he is one of the few uh, Indian diplomats who has uh, a very wide-ranging exposure to Africa, a understanding of uh, Africa that uh, perhaps a uh, few of us uh, have, and he's written, uh, written a book about uh, Africa and India-Africa relations, uh, which really is uh, like a classic reference book. So. Welcome to you, uh, Gurjit. Uh, so Hash has already spoken a great deal about uh, Nelson Mandela, uh, the man, the leader. Uh, let me say that uh, you know it's it's a, a great occasion for us uh, honoring his memory because he's the first foreigner, by the way, who was uh, awarded the Bharat Ratna. So uh, he's. In a sense, he is one of us. Uh, you know that we should have, you know, uh, honored him uh, with the Bharat Ratna. Uh, really testifies to the tremendous respect and reverence, in a sense, uh, that Indians have uh, for Nelson Mandela. Um, let me also uh, point out that uh, 
you know, uh, Nelson Mandela uh, was uh, someone who, in a, in a sense, there was a, almost an uh, instinctive empathy uh, between India and South Africa, between, you know, Nelson Mandela and India's own uh, leaders, because in a sense, they were part and parcel of the same uh, international struggle for justice, for equity. Um, India was one of the first countries which actually, at the United Nations, initiated uh, the uh, you know international international movement against uh, apartheid, and this was uh, something which was recognized by uh, Nelson uh, Mandela himself. Uh, and this goes back to 1946, you know, the first very first resolution on uh, apartheid. Um, Many people perhaps do not know that there was another Indian who was very closely associated uh, with the anti-apartheid uh, struggle, and that is Enuga Srinivasulu Reddy, uh, who for several years at the United Nations really spearheaded uh, the international uh, you know, movement uh, to, to, to rid the world of racism and, uh, and uh, apartheid. Um, one of the one of the uh, important uh, important things about uh, Mandela is that um, you know there are many leaders in the world. Uh, we have had leaders. We other countries have had leaders. But I think what uh, really uh, distinguishes him from other leaders is that he is not merely a leader, but he is a statesman. Uh, and I think that distinction is very uh, important. There can be many leaders, but uh, perhaps. Uh, being a statesman is a much more difficult, uh, you know, job. And I think uh, Mandela, by the uh, reference to the reconciliation that he was uh, was uh, responsible for between the between the whites and the blacks, um, in a sense, he embodied, in a very real sense, uh, the kind of uh, you know. Um, the, 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 the sense of reconciliation that uh, somebody like Mahatma Gandhi uh, brought uh, at a time when, one, there was division uh, between Hindus and Muslims. Uh, there was also, uh, you know, the uh, struggle uh, against British colonialism, but that uh, uh, did not, did not uh, prevent uh, India uh, from uh, establishing uh, a good cooperative relationship uh, with the former colonial masters. And you see that very much repeated in uh, South Africa uh, as well. Um, so um, we, 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 um, we uh, find that, uh, you know, uh, Mandela is, is uh, is uh, that is that is the I think it is called the Rivon, Rivonia um, revolt, uh, yeah, yeah, Rivonia trial, uh, which really establishes him as the as a as a leader of uh, the South African struggle against uh, apartheid, uh, and in which he um, you know said uh, and became a kind of a of an iconic uh, figure. Uh, he uh, said that. Uh, That uh, you know, this the the the, um, uh, the democracy and freedom for South Africa is a ca cause for which he is willing to die. Uh, that is a famous statement that he made, and from then on, really, he became internationally an iconic uh, figure. Uh, also. Um, uh, Mandela also uh, uh, acknowledged uh, the the um, contribution uh, of India, in particular Mahatma Gandhi, in terms of you know, uh, kind of providing that spiritual inspiration uh, for the struggle against apartheid. He said, uh, "Quote: The Mahatma is an integral part of our history because it is here that he first experimented with truth, here that he demonstrated his." characteristic firmness in the pursuit of justice. Uh, and it is here that he developed Satyagraha as a philosophy and as an instrument of struggle. Uh, 
Uh, so uh, you can see here, uh, you know, that that kind of, uh, you know, uh, a, a spiritual bond that he had uh, with uh, Gandhi. Uh, it is also perhaps um, not uh, fully uh, appreciated, as I mentioned, Reddy's uh, contribution. But, um, you know, it is also a, a fact that, uh, you know, when the uh, kind of international movement started, and you had ANC leaders who were also part and parcel of that mobilization. Uh, somebody like uh, Oliver Tambo, for example, when he went uh, out, uh, you know, of South Africa, became one of the one of the uh, uh, you know people who really tried to mobilize international public opinion against uh, apartheid. Uh, you know, he traveled uh, the world over with an Indian passport. Uh, it was Jawaharlal Nehru who actually provided him with a. Indian passport so that he could travel uh, across uh, the world. Uh, so there has been that, um, that kind of a, uh, as I said, a, almost a kind of a spiritual link uh, between our two uh, countries. I'm sure that Gurjeet will be speaking much more about it. Lastly, I would just say that I had the great privilege of uh, actually uh, meeting um, uh, Nelson Mandela uh, when I, had, I was serving in the prime minister's office uh, under Narsimha Rao, and uh, I think it was at a Commonwealth uh, summit that uh, there was a meeting between Nelson Mandela and Prime Minister Narsimha Rao, and uh, I still recall that uh, the, that meeting with uh, with uh, you know a great sense of humility. In a, in a, I would say um, I, I it was it was uh, a great uh, experience, you know, coming across such a, as I said, such an iconic uh, figure. So that memory has stayed very much uh, in my mind. Uh, so let me uh, end my introductory remarks uh, now, and uh, I would request uh, the Excellency High Commissioner uh, to please felicitate uh, our uh, distinguished speaker um, uh, today with a, with a shot. Yeah. Oh, sorry, with a stone. Uh, I would now request our distinguished speaker uh, for today, uh, Ambassador Gurji Singh, to deliver the fifth Nelson Mandela lecture. You have the floor. The chairman of IIC, Ambassador Sham Saran, to whom I owe a big debt of gratitude, because he was the one who posted me to Ethiopia and the African Union as ambassador and gave me perhaps my professionally most satisfying posting. High Commissioner Endebele, good to see you again, sir. And my dear friend, Mr. Suhas Borkar, how privileged South Africa is to have you to always support their activities in India. Thank you. I see my friend, Mr. K. N. Srivastava, Director, I see Mr. Damu Revi, Secretary, MEA, and so many friends from different parts of my life, former High Commissioner and Ambassadors. Thank you for being here. When I told Suhas that this is an honor, it truly is an honor. Anything associated with Madiba is an honor. So let me first talk about Madiba. Nelson Mandela was a legend in his lifetime. I remember him as a Bhagat Singh kind of figure. Through sheer perseverance, won a new stature for himself and his country while incarcerated. He showed how aspirations could be fulfilled and lived to see them. So as Suhas said, Madiba Tujhe Salam. So today I wore this shirt specially. This is an Indonesian Batik shirt by the designer Ivan Tirta. And he called it a Madiba shirt. And in, in South Africa, these were often called Madiba shirts. The, all of them were not by Ivan Tirta, which my friends from Indonesia will know what it means to own an Ivan Tirta shirt. And uh, the Mandela shirt, according to Ivan Tirta, enhanced Ivan's charisma 
and Madiba's stature, and Madiba became a Batik icon as far as Ivan Tirta and Indonesia were concerned. A very strange link why he chose to wear Indonesian Batiks. There are many reasons given, but I think he just liked it, and I think he was a simple man. I met uh, Madiba directly only once. It was on 29 November 2001, High Commissioner Mukherjee was there, when we went with the then Minister of State, Omar Abdullah, and we contributed a million dollars to the Mandela Foundation. He joked on that occasion about Mahatma Gandhi and said, you guys sent me a lawyer, and I turned him into a Mahatma. And of course, there was much mirth. To which I remember asking him, Madiba, we have many more lawyers. But he did not take up the challenge. <laughs> On that occasion, he said that this was not the first instance of the generosity shown by India to him personally and to South Africa as a whole. And that the donation would go a very long way in assisting the foundation's work. It may be remembered that Madiba had won the Gandhi Peace Prize, but he in turn had donated the entire amount for Gujarat earthquake relief. So it was not that he was only looking for donations. He was happy to give what he got and share it with others. The next time I saw him was about a year later. Actually, it was the 9th of July, 2002, when it was the foundation day of the African Union. And the African Union was launched in Durban on that day when the OAU converted. And I will talk about that. But the, what I remember is that the longest applause was reserved for a man who was no more president, though there were 31 presidents in that stadium. And that was Madiba. I remember seeing him 2010 at the World Cup soccer finals in Johannesburg. And I remember that because he was the most exciting thing, much better than the Spain versus Netherlands football match, which was so boring. But Madiba going around in what looked like a Pope mobile around the stadium was actually the excitement. And you could see this excitement run through the crowd. And that was Madiba's Kares Karisma till then. When I went to Indonesia in 2012, I was also ambassador to Timor Leste. And there they revere him because he went to meet their independence leaders in jail, Zanana Gusmao, in Indonesian jail, and then appealed to the Indonesian leaders to release him and start negotiating for peace like he had done. And that set in pace a new motion for Timor Leste to become independent and through a referendum and ultimately have a good relationship with Indonesia. Dear friends, ladies and gentlemen, the subject given to me today to deliver this lecture actually is contemporary Africa and its challenges. So let me try and deal with them in a few. There are so many challenges, I can't deal with them all, but let me highlight a few. In 2019, Africa was seen as having turned the corner in its development. Six of the top 10 fastest growing economies were African. The demographic dividend was likely to pay off. Better efforts to meet the SDGs were visible. Africa's trade with the world was growing. And for the first time, trade and investment with Africa were outpacing aid into Africa. This was the crucial aspect to make Africa the opportunity that matters where trade and FDI could take the place of consistent aid. On one occasion at a meeting, Madiba sipped water. And then he said, after 27 years in jail, the least you expect is something harder. <laughs> there were promises made at the NAPAD in 2001 the New Africa, New Economic Partnership for African Development, which preceded the African Union in 2002, about 22 years ago. Now, that was the time of the African Renaissance from 1998 to 2002, which was led by 
Madiba's successor, Thabo Mbeki, as president. And there was, of course, Mr. Wad and Mr. Obasanjo and others involved in this. But this African Renaissance led to NEPAD and the African Union. And the inspiration behind it was always Madiba, or what he achieved in what Ambassador Shamsar and, and Mr. Suhas Borkar have already explained to you. It seemed that NEPAD objectives were going to be fulfilled. And then the pandemic struck, reducing trade, investment, and increasing aid. These sharp turns and twists are often the story of contemporary Africa. Let us look at a few trends and how they impact. Let us first look at governance. On 9 July, I mentioned to you that the OAU converted to the African Union on 9 July 2002. The AU provided a framework for three triad arrangements. The Pan-African institutions to be developed with the help of the Africa Development Bank and the UN Economic Commission for Africa. This included the Pan-African Parliament. At the next level were the regional economic communities. Africa had over 40 of them. But the AU brought in eight of them, broadly conforming to regions, but not entirely, because regional overlords always had a say. And then there were the member states. In 2002, since 2002, one new member, South Sudan, has been added. But Morocco rejoined the African Union in 2017, having left the OAU 33 years earlier. Today, the African Union has 55 members. 54 of them are in the UN. The Saharvi Arab Democratic Republic is not. As 54 votes in the UN, they can be a formidable force. Every partner woos Africa for the sheer number of votes it has. The AU intent was to have Africa's voice heard better internationally. It succeeded for a time. Now, after two decades, the AU is being assessed for effectiveness. Recent successes have come AU's way. And I think during the pandemic, the role of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention was quite admirable, given the challenges. Uh, the Africa Continental FTA, which I'm going to talk about, is another success. But the AU has not been able to pull together a common vision on climate change, on peace and security, on its voice on the even, on the UN, or even how partnerships should be governed. Nevertheless, its continental FTA has provided new hope that in the post-pandemic period, regional markets and greater intra-African trade could boost African economies. It potentially is the largest FTA in terms of countries covered and 1.3 billion people in them. A report by the World Bank anticipates that AFCFTA could lift 30 million Africans out of extreme poverty and boost the incomes of nearly 70 million people and generate $450 billion in income by 2035. Is Africa better off with the African Union than it would have been without it? I believe so. All criticism of the African Union is actually an aspiration because we expect it to perform better. The problems within the African Union are no more uniquely theirs. ASEAN and today the European Union are equally afflicted by the same problems of how to have harmonious views which can bring all the members together. I quote Madiba, do not judge me by my successes. Judge me by how many times I fell down and got back again. That is what we expect from Africa. The second issue that I wish to raise, the notion that Africa is one in the United Nations is not always true. A problem which has emerged for Africa is that despite its 54 votes in the UN and its desire to have its voice heard, its ability to influence the reform of the UN has been circumscribed by its own Ezulvuni consensus. 
which sets impossible demands and thus stymies rather than helps the process forward. I'm sorry for being so blunt, but this is a problem in Africa. And we are all pussyfooting around it and not telling the Africans what we really feel. This is what we feel. Africa undoubtedly needs clear representation with two permanent members. This is what the G4 offered Africa, with South Africa and Nigeria were willing in 2005. But there were two extraordinary summits in Addis Ababa, of which I was there. But they could not bring a consensus among all the countries to back them. Africa wants two seats, but will not say who those two are. And then it says, whoever those two are must have the veto. No, these are convoluted positions, not practical politics. It is partly stoked by the coffee club and China, who will not let the Ezelwuni consensus be resolved, which means that ultimately African members are not getting either two permanent seats or any more non-permanent seats. Africa has shown little signs of trying to resolve these hurdles. It has placed on its own path and thus its ambition to be better represented in the world is not held back by anybody else but by themselves. Of course, there is no guarantee that if they were to nominate two countries, they could have a consensus among the P5. But Africa needs to make moves to take the process forward. And I again quote Madiba, I learned that courage was not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. The brave man is not he who does not feel afraid, but he who conquers that fear. Let's go to the third aspect. How does Africa's development get financed? In other words, how does Africa transition from a donor model to a trade and investment model? Over the last two years, there have been 12 attempted coups in Africa, six of them successful, two in the same country. Four African countries are currently suspended from the AU for such acts. However, earlier AU efforts to declare unconstitutional changes to extend terms of presidents as equivalent to a coup have faltered. And today, the AU does not act against presidents who have overstayed their term limits and are set to install dynasties. It has also not been able to act against larger countries. In 2022, finally, the AU lists about 28 steps towards such reform some of them quite unclear. They include better tackling of social media disinformation to developing, quote, a comprehensive framework establishing different categories of sanctions that may be gradually applied, unquote, to countries where coups take place. This was approved at the Malabo Extraordinary Summit on Terrorism and Unconstitutional Changes of Government in May 2022. The aspirations, though, are curtailed by the ambitions of individual countries who, while may not be able to exercise power internationally, can certainly access power in Addis Ababa to prevent action against themselves. So one of the problems is that many of the economies which were doing well up to two years ago have imploded, either through internal conflict or rivalries or with terrorism. This creates new demands for humanitarian assistance and reduces them back to basket cases rather than attract investors. The pandemic has further aggravated this in most African countries. The continental FTA, which started in 2021, sought open borders. The pandemic insisted on closed borders. Such are the contradictions Africa has to live with. There are 700 companies in Africa which have a turnover of up to a billion dollars per year. However, of these, half of them are in one country, South Africa. 25% are in the North African countries. In the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa, there are only about 180 such companies. These need augmentation and the continental FTA can help, 
but prudent and consistent policies and tax regulation is important. The inability of the AU to have consistent governance practices for its members means that the private sector now chooses countries on its own and practically more investment goes to the larger, well-established countries than to the newer countries trying to break free. In 2019, Sub-Saharan Africa attracted $32 billion of FDI, of which $5 billion was in South Africa. In 2020, it was $39 billion. In 2021, according to UNCTAD, it, SSA obtained $38 billion, which is less than 2.5% of global FDI. This is the route that we need to watch out for. Now, Africa struggles to pick up momentum among a slowdown in global act activity, continued supply constraints, outbreaks of new variants of the coronavirus, high inflation, and rising financial risks. This leads us to why private sector investments are so important. This is because Africa faces debt stress and under the G20 initiative is under a debt rehabilitation plan. African countries don't wish to borrow more because they have constraints. The ability of the international community to lend more now is also diminished. This includes China, whose BRI funding were large over a period of time, but if you see recent announcement and action, China has also cooled off. Madiba said, money won't create success, the freedom to make it will. Let me now come to the youth factor. This is another important aspect of contemporary Africa. The median age in Africa is 19. 40% of Africa's population is under the age of 15. By 2050, there will be 90 cities with a population of 1 million or more. The rapid urbanization and growth of young population means greater requirements for education and employment. The labor force is growing rapidly and Africa needs 200 million jobs over the next decade. The reality is that during the pandemic, 22 million jobs were lost and have not been recreated. Africa needs to have growth centers where investment can be attracted and employment generated for its growing youth. Leaving youth unoccupied is part of the problem of radicalization and terrorism in some parts of Africa who feel disgruntled of the lot that they have been left with. Africa often has to deal with issues which are not of its making. Much like us, the pandemic is one, the Ukraine crisis another, climate change a third. All these impact recovery in Africa, but higher commodity prices, higher food and fuel prices, increased inflation, tighten global financial conditions, and reduce foreign flows into the region. Here I want to come and say, let's not forget the children, something which is not often talked about. The SDG 8.7, is among the most neglected of the SDGs. In June 2021, the ILO and UNICEF announced the first shocking increase in the number of child labor worldwide. In two decades, during the first four years of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, even before the start of the pandemic, when the world grew $10 trillion richer, the number of child labor in the world rose to an appalling 160 million, over half of which 86 million children are in sub-Saharan Africa. Just a tiny fraction of expenditure, less than $50 billion spent in developing countries annually would extend social protection to all children and pregnant women in such countries and substantially reduce extreme poverty. The globalization of social protection is a historic idea whose time has come. We could think of a unified financing model for SDGs than allow trust-like funds from chasing individual SDGs. The Mandela Foundation has poverty and inequality as one of its focal areas. Social protection is an inalienable part of that. 
and there is also a parallel Mandela Children's Fund, which has protection of children and social protection as one of its core ideas. We need a vision of Mandela for the children and youth of Africa as there lies the future of our planet. As Madiba said, a fundamental concern for others in our individual and community lives would go a long way in making the world the better place we so passionately dream of. Now, I have two aspects left, but I'm going to decide which one to talk about. Is it going to be peace and security, or is it going to be about climate change? Let's do climate change. I think climate change is wrecking Africa. Among the least funded international conventions is the UNCCD, which basically targets Africa. So let's leave this whole inequality business out. That's what I meant, the trust funds. UNEP is in Africa, but the developed countries hived off the conventions to leave UNEP emasculated and put money where they want it, in Montreal Protocol or in the climate change, and left the CCD where it was, untenanted. But what happened to Africa? They are going to host the COP in Egypt this year. This is time for them to do something to get that extra money which has always been promised to them. There is the great green wall project across 20 countries in the Sahel and the Sahara. Imagine if that green wall project had started, perhaps would Sahelian radicalization have diminished or not come to these levels? So there are, and the green, great green wall project, we have been talking about it for 10 years, but I never understand why these African priorities are so rarely taken up by countries in their bilateral engagement with their partners. They don't really ask you to do something, even though many of them in the central and western part are part of the Green uh, Great Wall. So something about Agenda 2063, it has great ideas, but I had never heard of a country in its bilaterals or a wreck in its meetings with us ever raise the fulfillment of Agenda 2063. This marriage between ideals and realization, praxis, is sorely required in Africa, and this is a big challenge. Finally, let me come to the end. You know, Madiba had an amazing sense of humor. When he came out of jail, people looked to him for wisdom. But actually, he had a huge amount of wisecracks. But most of them fell through the cracks. Because nobody expected this man coming after so many years in jail to still have a sense of humor. And Madiba's humor, I mean, I could have told you a series of jokes today, but then I would have risked never being invited to the IIC again. So I shall restrain myself to a few had a great sense of humor. So very early on, a foreign journalist asked him, Madiba, you have come out of jail, you were an outlaw, and today there is a coin with your figure on it. He said, yeah, that's when you have made it, when you have your own money. <laughs> now, many people took that seriously, but I think he had this very naughty sense of humor. Madiba once said that this is after retirement, he was walking in Johannesburg and he met this foreign couple, which he says came from a very well-known country without naming it. And the husband recognized him and said, Mr. Mandela. So he stopped and said, yeah, often people mistake me for that rascal. <laughs> so that husband was not convinced and he kept telling the wife, that's Mr. Mandela, that's Mr. Mandela. And she said, who is Mandela? So why is he famous? The husband said, Mandela. So the wife couldn't stop. She looked at Mandela and said, Mr. Mandela, why are you famous? And then Mandela said, that is a question I couldn't answer. So I left it at that. So ladies and gentlemen, let me also leave it at that. And I hope that after this, there'll be something harder. Um, 
thank you very much, uh, Gurjeet. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a most uh, erudite, but also most uh, engaging lecture, uh, full of uh, insights, uh, but also uh, full of uh, humor. Uh, a fitting tribute uh, to the uh, memory of a very great uh, leader, uh, Nelson Mandela. Uh, your uh, exposition on the key challenges which are uh, facing Africa, um, the recent uh, setback after a period of, uh, I would say, great optimism about the future of uh, Africa. But I think what really also emerges from your lecture is that, uh, you know, perhaps we underestimate the wellsprings of resilience, which also uh, is there amongst uh, African uh, countries. Um, you ended by talking about the sense of humor and naughtiness about, of uh, Nelson uh, Mandela. I think he once said that if he did not have a sense of humor, how would he survive 27 years in prison? Uh, I think uh, that's uh, something <laughs> perhaps also is, a, is, a, is an insight. Uh, I would also uh, like to just uh, before uh, giving the floor to His Excellency, uh, the High Commissioner. Uh, you mentioned um, the uh, uh, issue of UN reform. And um, I would like to recall uh, for our, for our uh, distinguished uh, audience here that uh, in 2004, at the uh, UN session in uh, New York, uh, you know, the group of four was formed uh, for uh, the four countries which were aspirants for permanent membership of the Security Council. Actually, it was supposed to be a group of five. Um, so the night before the announcement of the group of four was made, um, there was a group of five. Because we had a meeting of the five heads of state, which included, in fact, South Africa. So President Mabeki was very much part and parcel of that summit meeting which took place, where a decision was taken that the five countries would go next day and announce a slate of five who would be the aspirants for permanent membership of the Security Council. So South Africa was very much part and parcel of that. In the morning, four of us were waiting, you know, across the table. The press conference was supposed to take place and we were waiting for President Mabeki to come. Uh, there seemed to be a delay, so we thought maybe it is the famous New York traffic. Then we got a call from the Foreign Minister <laughs> of South Africa uh, saying that President Mabeki deeply regrets, but he will not be able to come and join uh, this group of uh, five because of what he said that there had to be a consensus amongst the 54 countries of Africa before South Africa could possibly put forward its uh, you know, candidature for uh, the Security uh, Council. Of course, it was obvious that having 54 countries to decide on one candidate was simply not possible. I wish South Africa had taken that step, had the courage to take that step at that time. You chickened out. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much, and let me now uh, invite uh, His Excellency, the High Commissioner of uh, South Africa, to make some concluding remarks. You have the floor, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for a very inspiring uh, uh, exposition of uh, about Matiba, about our struggle about uh, where we are now, what are the issues that are confronting us. But uh, I wanted to go back just uh, because it is Mandela Day, just perhaps to remind ourselves on some of the, of the key points uh, of uh, the leadership of uh, Nelson Mandela. The most famous, of course, is uh, when he was faced with a, not a theoretical, but a, a real death sentence in 1964 at the Rivonia trial. 
uh, it was not a, th a theoretical uh, possibility. It was real because some of the of those accused in the other cases uh, in Devon and Cape Town and Port, and Port Elizabeth had actually been sentenced to death. And uh, those having been sentenced to death were sentenced to death with him as the commander. So that uh, it was very clear that uh, that he was going, they, they were going to the Carlos, at least five of them, including uh, Walter Sisulu, Coven and Begi, uh, and uh, Mr. Katrada. So he, it was very clear that uh, th this is what he was facing. And uh, it was there that he declared uh, to that judge, Tivet, sitting there, that uh, this is what I've done, this is wh why we did it, and uh, the, if we, we had an opportunity to do it again, or if we walked out of here, we'll continue where we ended. Do your damned test. I am prepared to die. This is what I've lived for. This is what uh, I want to continue to achieve. But if it's your wish, I'm prepared to die. That was breathtaking. And uh, the court did go silent completely. And uh, of course, uh, the judge himself knew that he was with all the triumphalism of uh, the National Party at that time, he knew that he was carrying a, a very, very heavy burden on his shoulders. And uh, when he came, when he said, they are all sentenced to life, it was like uh, they've been acquitted because uh, uh, they knew that uh, history would absolve them. But the other very, very uh, troublesome, uh, some, something that will, 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 will shake you is when you, 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 you create your environment and you get familiar to it and you get resigned to it. Uh, I'm in prison and uh, you resign to yourself to the prison and then, of course, you keep the hope going that uh, the people will triumph. It's not so much that uh, you will get out of prison, but the people will triumph. Possibly, most possibly, without me. A and you, you reconcile yourself to that position. And uh, there have been many uh, pseudo offers by the apartheid regime for him to say, but Mr. Mandela, you are 60 now. Just take your things and just go, go home, go back to the trans guy. Meaning go back to a tribal structure and confirm the supremacy of the white uh, bus cup. And uh, that he had refused and refused and refused. But uh, the tide had changed by 1985. The tide had changed because the whole world, uh, from there to a sole speech by the Indian representative at the United Nations in 1946, who amongst all other triumphant generals who had conquered during uh, the Second World War, they are now creating the United Nations and uh, they defeated Hitler and uh, now they were creating a new world after their own fashion, and there was no longer anything to disturb them. That lady, representative from India, just stood up and said, well, I have got no military medals. I want no war. Uh, I seek freedom and I'm happy that the United Nations is, is created. But we fought this war to make the world uh, safe, to make democracy safe for the world. 
So what democracy is it that we are talking about when the Indian people, uh, my people, and the black people in general in South Africa still uh, slave under Group Areas Act, under pass laws, under racism. They can't enter this, they can't enter that. They, you, you've got uh, the Indian community in South Africa who can't even swim in the Indian Ocean. It, it, it's a, it, how, how do you have to ask for permission to go and swim in the, at sea? Uh, so when she, she said this, General Jan Smarts, who had been part of, uh, who was leading South Africa and was part uh, of the British cabinet, or of the British war cabinet, said, stood up and said, young lady, you don't know how much harm you have caused me. Because she just demolished all this triumphalism that they won in Dubrook, they won there, they won there, but what were you fighting Hitler about? Hitler is not dead because he's very much alive in South Africa. That fascism that we're fighting is very much alive in South Africa. What were you talking about? And it is this, these moments like this that, uh, of course, the, the support that we're getting from India and internationally saved a, a catastrophe that would have uh, happened had uh, Mandela and his colleagues been hanged in 1964. But again, in 1985, when uh, the international mobilization had gained uh, such uh, success throughout the world, apartheid could not uh, do this. Apartheid could not play their cricket. They could not play their rugby. They could not play uh, their favorite sports. They could not go anywhere without being hounded. Uh, could apartheid go home and, and so forth. Now, in 1985, both uh, the apartheid prime minister had no other choice than to seem to, uh, to be seen to be trying to change. Therefore, he, with a great fanfare, he announced that uh, he was going to release Mandela and uh, he had offered uh, Mandela freedom. But what was this freedom? It was freedom as long as he renounced that he was now, the age he was, he should just go home and uh, uh, enjoy life with his uh, family and uh, we are old now, Mandela, and uh, just go. And uh, he had to renounce viol what was called violence. And by violence, they did not, someone, they did not mean someone carrying AK-47 and all that and throwing bombs. By violence, people demonstrating in the street, demonstrating in uh, churches, the youth, women, everyone demonstrating for basic, basic rights. That was called violence. Therefore, that's what Mandela was being asked to do. And uh, he responded. He responded, uh, uh, he wrote his uh, own notes and handed them to uh, his uh, then wife, Winnie uh, Mandela. And, uh, but Winnie Mandela could not read uh, that statement because she herself was banned, could not address meetings. And therefore, it was read by uh, his daughter, Zinzi, uh, the late ambassador. And uh, this is what he said at that uh, gathering in uh, February 10, 1985. He said, uh, I cherish my own freedom dearly, but I care even more for your freedom. Too many have died since I went to prison. Too many have suffered for the love of freedom. I owe it to their widows, to their orphans, to their mothers, and to their fathers who have grieved and wept for them. Not only I have suffered during these long, lonely, wasted years. I'm no less life-loving life -loving than you are. 
but I cannot sell my birthright, nor am I prepared to sell the birthright of the people to be free. I am in prison as a representative of the people, and your organization and the, the ANC, which was banned. What freedom am I being offered while the organization of the people remains banned? What freedom am I being offered when I may be arrested on a past offense? What freedom am I being offered when I need to stamp, when I need a stamp in my past to seek work? What freedom am I being offered to live my life as a family with my dear wife who remains in punishment in Brantford? What freedom am I being offered when I must ask for permission to live in an urban area? Prisoners cannot negotiate. I will return. That offer, that rejection of that offer, of course, for those of us who were in prison uh, with him at that time, liberated us because not only had they given that offer to Matiba, they'd offer, they'd given that offer to all of us. Uh, High-ranking generals and brigadiers will come, and you sit there. There are seven sitting here in a panel, and you sit alone there, and say, "Spoon Devele, you have been in prison now for eight years. Uh, you are sentenced to ten years. Just sign this thing and just go home. When you." To go out of the door, you'll be free. It was a very traumatizing thing because you had adjusted yourself to, to what it was, what prison was, and then someone just come with this trauma to, 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 to really wreck your soul like that. But this statement that came out on the 10th of February was such a, a, a relief to all of us who were still in prison because we... we it removed this responsibility uh, from all of us. They will say, we are here, we are here until it is declared that we must renounce violence. The violence of the state of emergency, of banishment, of imprisonment without trial, of uh, keeping the country uh, under virtually martial law because uh, you have caspers moving up and down every street. So it, it was that. And uh, that no of Nelson Mandela in 1985 unleashed a new energy to the anti-apartheid movement throughout the world. And uh, the apartheid regime could no longer be the same. And uh, you then had uh, uh, the Harare Declaration uh, being adopted by the OAU at the time and uh, the United Nations finally adopting that so that there was now one position for the whole world. It was no longer India there and that country there and that country there supporting, but the whole United Nations was now behind a program, not an anti-apartheid program, but a program for the freedom of the people of South Africa. It's not what we are struggling against. What are we struggling for? This is what we are struggling for and stand up and oppose. You don't want a non-racial society, what do you want? You don't want a, a natural freedom, what do you want? And it was this challenge that, that, that was there. And the, 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 the apartheid regime was, was shaken altogether. A story is told of uh, the ministers of, of apartheid at that time, uh, Kobi Kutsi, uh, Minister of Justice and Prisons, a coroner, of a minister of education, and others discussing amongst themselves, uh, amongst the key, just the demands that were being made in South Africa throughout. And the most prominent, of course, was the uh, demand for the abolition of Bantu education and, pro and uh, demand for proper education. And uh, of course, we in prison were also demanding the conditions uh, to have better conditions. That's what all prisoners do. The first thing you do is to demand better conditions. And uh, suddenly, P.W. Porter, the apartheid president uh, in, uh, in their cabinet, suddenly said, 
all these demands, the demands that were being put by prisoners, uh, proper food, oh, yes, we're even demanding chicken, oh, even amongst ourselves, you know, but this is too much to, to think that the poor will agree to chicken in jail. But suddenly, yes, and uh, not only that, they were re going to remove the, the floor mats and put beds. Ah, I know. Uh, with prisoners, there's a lot of rumors that go around before the thing happens. And these rumors, there's going to be beds. No, man, no. And you won't even remember how to sleep on a bed without falling and, and all that. No, and indeed, beds came. Chicken in jail came. And pajamas, even. You're wearing pajamas. It was, it was a, quite a strange thing and all this. And uh, when we, we understood the, the debate amongst the ministers themselves, that uh, no, let's improve uh, prison conditions. Coroner of Minister of Education was saying, look, this thing that uh, is being demanded by the children of Soweto and the old black children for just a library in a school, a laboratory in a school, proper classroom with doors and windows, that's not really too much. Let's give it to them. And uh, then the prisoners are asking just for these conditions and so forth. And uh, Kobe Kutie and uh, Kornov are pushing these demands. Kobe Kutie demands by prisoners for better conditions. And Kornov is putting these demands uh, for schools and laboratories and so forth and conditions and school and improve uh, that. P.W. Porter says to Kornov, no. No libraries, no laboratories, no windows in classrooms, no doors, no. All these things that the students are demanding, which are clearly so reasonable, no. Then uh, this demand that is being put by Kobe Kutsia, Minister of Prisons, pajamas, beds, chicken, eggs, all these things. And uh, P.W. Porter says, yes. Now, what is this now? Kornov, uh, Dr. Kornov, who is a minister of education, says, no, but Mr. President, what is this? Uh, the school children, they are really asking something that is reasonable and all this and all that. You say no. But these terrorists are asking for uh, prob these beds and pajamas and chicken and all this, you say yes, what, what is going on? And PW President uh, Apartheid says, no, but you are a doctor, Kornov. You should think. You think that when Mandela is released from prison, do you think he's going to take us to school or take us to prison? <laughs> we are not doing this for him, we are doing for ourselves that uh, by the time they send us to prison, conditions will have improved. But uh, we're not go going to be sent to school. That is what was going into their minds, that uh, we are going to do to them what they did to us. But Mandela and the organization that he led was different. He was not the one to say, you shall do unto others as they did to you. What is the point? How better are you if you are fighting injustice and then you visit that same injustice to the, to the people uh, who, who inflicted injustice against you? You are, better th you are not better than them. It's just removing one set of oppressor for another set of oppressor. But Mandela was talking about a non-racial, just, democratic society. And that what we have established. And uh, it is this that uh, is a proud legacy of South Africa, uh, that uh, all the people, the, the future, and uh, whatever is in South Africa is in the hands of the people. They elect like everybody else. They elect this one, and elect that one, and elect that one. And uh, it's not forever. It's a five-year term. After that, you renew your mandate, and the conditions are such that you can vote whatever you want to vote. And the, the people of South Africa are exercising that right very, very vigorously. So 
That is the legacy that uh, Nelson Mandela left for us. And of course, he aspired for a, a better Africa and a better world. And uh, the AU, which was uh, succeeded the OAU, was established in, uh, in South Africa and then in 2002. And uh, then there was all these interventions with the AU to have a peer review mechanism, such that sovereignty is fine, but uh, you are not like uh, others were saying, we, are, we must be free to manage and mismanage our affairs. No, we are not free to mismanage our own affairs. The people must count whether they are in South Africa or any other country in Africa, they count. Somebody must talk, speak for them. Just like the people in India were speaking for us there. It had nothing to do with Indians, this apartheid there. But the Indian people stood out at the United Nations, everywhere else, and lost many opportunities they could have had in terms of trade and all that. And said, we're cutting off, boycotting South Africa and so forth. Not that it didn't hurt economically, but they say we sacrifice that for our, all our people to be free. So similarly, we must do the same in terms of Africa and, uh, and the world. And uh, this is what uh, we hope to still achieve uh, in concert with other uh, co uh, friends, uh, other compatriots on the African continent, so that we should not be a crying continent. We should not be a, a continent uh, still struggling against basic human rights and, and all those things. So it is this legacy, therefore, that says the struggle goes on. The struggle is our life, and it shall always go on. And next year, 2023, we shall be celebrating 30 years of the relations between, diplomatic relations between India and South Africa. And uh, we should, we see this as a huge milestone. And uh, if you look at a program like the Red Fort Declaration, uh, a number of uh, issues are raised in that declaration. I think it's 11 uh, issues. There is so much to achieve to take that uh, declaration with a vigor, with new vigor, and uh, implement it for the sake of our people in India and in South Africa. We are bound together by a history. You gave us a, a Gandhi who in his first uh, court appearance here after qualifying in London, uh, he appeared uh, in a case in, 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 in what was called Bombay at the time. Completely tongue-tied. Could not utter one sentence in defense of his client. He was not familiar with Indian law, with uh, Indian history, culture, and everything else. Shortly after that, he went to South Africa. And in South Africa, he found his voice. He found his voice. That tongue-tied lawyer could leave uh, Winston Churchill mesmerized. Uh, he was. He would say anything. Called him a half-naked, half-naked fakir. But who won? Who had the last laugh? It was Mahatma Gandhi. It was India, uh, when it, India finally had its own trust with, uh, with destiny. That was the triumph of what had been uh, despised as a half-naked fakir. And uh, the whole world changed and, and on. So that we have got this power, historical power with us, and this content, contemporary power that we have, and uh, we need to push, to push and make for a better world. Better United Nations and better non-aligned movement and uh, 
better program, a more vigorous program between South Africa and India that we have already declared in the Red Fort Declaration. I think we, we've got so much going for us. And thank you very much for being such a reliable support all the time, every time. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Excellency, for those very moving remarks. Uh, a personal recounting of what has been a very inspirational uh, story. Uh, a story which continues to inspire us both in Africa as well as uh, in India. And uh, I would like to also reiterate what you said, that there is such a lot to be done uh, in terms of uh, the future. And that future would be much brighter. That tryst with destiny will be perhaps much more monumental if India and South Africa worked together. So thank you very much uh, for those remarks. I would once again like to thank my colleague uh, Gurjeet for also his very inspirational uh, you know, uh, lecture today. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, also thank uh, uh, Suhash for uh, once again uh, you know, organizing this absolutely wonderful uh, you know, event in memory of one of the greatest uh, statesmen the world has uh, seen. Um, thank you all, all of you for uh, being here and participating in this, uh, in this very, uh, shall I say, uh, again a very inspirational uh, event for all of us uh, because it bring, brings us back in touch with uh, something which is so noble, something which is uh, perhaps uh, much bigger than ourselves, uh, something which we sometimes uh, you know, forget. Uh, and having that, even for a moment, that connection uh, is so important for all of us. Thank you very much. And um, before we end, uh, we will have the uh, national anthem of the two uh, countries, after which we will close this event. Thank you very much once again.